In this exciting head-to-head, -head, it is the earliest surviving Wedge Princess versus the very last Austin Ambassador. And because these cars are so amazing, this is going to be a two-part video. In this first one, we're going to take a look at a princess which is not actually technically a princess. So technically, this is not a princess you see before you. This is a Wolseley 2200. Uh, the um, uh, 1822 they were kind of known as or ADO 71 uh, this wedge styled executive car replacement for the Land Crab but for the first I think 18 months of production um, they were badged as Wolseley, Austin or Morris uh, they were launched in 1975 um, actually received pretty well by the motoring press uh, which proves they didn't just go in for BL bashing um, it was quite a well-regarded car, quite futuristic for the 70s, perhaps a bit too futuristic. And um, buyers generally didn't really go for this model. But yes, it's a slightly confusing start to life. Uh, the shape was penned by Harris Mann, who also designed the TR7, and um, would also later do the um, Morris Ital and uh, not the Ital designed, it was um, Harris Mann who designed the Morris Ital and the facelift for this car indeed, the Austin Ambassador, which we'll come to later. Uh, this is a particularly rare car uh, because this is the oldest survivor. You'll notice it's actually on an M plate. Um, it was built in 1974 and uh, registered before the letters changed over that year. Um, so I think it was registered in June or July 1974. It is a pre-production car. It was built in the experimental department so um, it didn't actually go down the production line. It was built for testing of suspension and um, yeah it was used as a management car after that and uh, it's slightly confusing because um, when, when it actually came out of British Leyland in 1977 it didn't have the Walsley grille and it's perhaps because it was used to develop um, new styling tweaks such as these side repeaters which were part of the Princess 2 package launched in 1977 I think or maybe 78. Uh, it also didn't have um, the correct headlamps, it had the trapeze trapezoidal headlamps fitted and a flat bonnet without the grille. Um, again possibly because it was used to develop some of the styling tweaks of these Series 2 models. Uh, the current owner bought the car in 1977 uh, from British Leyland uh, because his brother was a development engineer uh, on the Princess um, as I'm just going to use the term um, and uh, he has owned it ever since. In the early 80s it suffered um, a wiring loom malfunction it was you know all hand put together and unfortunately some of the um, Lucas smoke escaped from the loom so um, it came off the road and wasn't recommissioned until about 2013, 2014. Uh, I remember seeing the car at Pride of Longbridge uh, in I think 2014 and it still had the flat um, grille, which was, yeah, slightly confusing. I wasn't expecting it to have that, um, the flat bonnet rather, rather than flat, flat grille. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that explains why uh, the owner then managed to track down the correct Wolseley bonnet and was able to return it to Wolseley specification. You can see we've got the um, British Leyland roundel there. So yeah, the Wolseley, Austin and Morris versions were quickly dispelled with and uh, that was partly because Austin and Morris finally merged properly. Uh, Austin and Morris became part of the same company, British Motor Corporation, in 1952 and the idea was that the two companies would merge and be able to pull resources and um, reduce um, expenditure on dealers and stuff but yeah that didn't quite happen. So in late um, 1975 uh, finally Austin and Morris were merged so there was no point having Austin and Morris versions of this car so they um, dispelled with those, dispelled with Wolseley as well it was the final nail in the coffin for Wolseley and um, the what became the Leyland Princess, Princess then becoming um, a mark in its own right, much as Mini had in 1969. Um, the Princess was then available as an L, a HL, and the Wolseley replacing HLS, which was the top spec super plush model. 
Um, and yeah, a slightly intriguing history, but sadly not a massive sales success. Uh, it was just a bit too unusual. Um, the engineering was perhaps a bit misunderstood and um, ultimately they didn't prove to be quite the car everyone had hoped. Uh, it's just a bit too out there. Um, in much the same way as the Citroen CX launched exactly the same year. And there are similarities with the CX in the hydrogas suspension used on these cars. It's an evolution of the hydroelastic system developed by um, Dr. Alex Moulton and um, very, very clever. Whereas the hydroelastic was rubber and fluid. Um, on these, with the hydrogas, there was now nitrogen gas in the displacers, very similar to the Citroen system. And it's interconnected front to rear. So as the front hits a bump, it lifts the rear, which reduces the pitching of the car. So it doesn't do that when it hits a bump, it stays level. Uh, same way as um, the Citroen DS and even the 2CV, which has interlinked suspension operating in the same way. Um, Hydrogas, the main difference is it's, um, it's, a, it's um, an inert system. You pump it up with a special machine and then you leave it. It's not like the Citroen Hydro Pneumatic where um, there's an engine driven pump so you can raise the car at will. That isn't possible here. If the car sags, you have to pump it up with a bit more fluid. Uh, one other issue, just like the Citroens, is the nitrogen eventually escapes from the displacers and the ride becomes horrible. And then you've just got to replace the displacers, which is a problem as you can't get them. I believe you can now regas the spheres. I think there are people who have finally worked out the technology to do that. But um, I think really, we need to start taking in um, the underbonnet area. I will just say the key difference between the two cars, no hatchback. This is a saloon. Um, again, not unusual for the time. The CX was always a saloon, never a, a hatchback. Uh, but some buyers felt that was a missed opportunity, especially as a year later, Rover launched the SD1, which of course did have um, a hatchback. Um, all a bit peculiar, but um, we shall have a quick browse of the interior as I find the bonnet release and uh, we'll come in here for a closer look in a moment but first let's lift the bonnet because the engine really does need talking about and i'm aware there's a lot of talking in this video but there's a lot to cover to be fair there we go gas struts on the bonnet that's lovely and there is the e6 transverse six cylinder engine now, frankly the development of this engine could probably do with um um, a, a, a separate video in itself but in short um, uh, British Leyland as was was trying to replace um, its elderly overhead valve engines and develop the E-series engine which first saw light of day in the Maxi well actually I think it first saw light of day down in Australia in the Morris Nomad and um, uh, I think there was a 1500 as well which um, used the E-series engine to kind of test it out, test it out on the Australians and then see if it works um, before committing to production in the UK. Australians also got the six cylinder version and um, it, it's um, a bit of a tortured engine development and a classic case of not quite getting things right really. Uh, the bores are Siamese and it's a very long stroke engine to, to keep it compact so it doesn't get too wide because the thinking was originally to have a side mounted radiator um, as per the Mini and the Maxi. But I think they were starting to learn that side mounted radiators are not a very good idea. What you really want is the radiator in the airflow at the front. That makes much more sense. So it was then needlessly compact because um, the gearbox, um, this is the clutch assembly on the end, the gearbox is beneath. Uh, in this case, an automatic, a four speed manual was also available. Um, but the engines at launch uh, were the B-series engine because they decided the E-series engine wasn't powerful enough. So the, um, yeah, so very, very British Leyland that the um, 1750cc overhead cam um, E-series engine was not powerful enough. So they decided to use the B-series engine, which was ancient um, in 1798cc form. It's just ridiculous it's just British Leyland down to a T. It, it's a bit of a compromised engine it's a very tall engine which necessitates a very high bonnet line it, yeah ultimately not a very good engine in many ways and not very powerful either I think even in this twin carb form it's 2.2 litres which is about as big as you can possibly go with this engine and um, about 110 brake horsepower I think so yeah it, 
It frustrates me, it really does. But it wasn't as good as it should have been. Nonetheless, straight six um, transverse engines, pretty rare. Um, Volvo have dabbled. I think the Land Rover Freelander 2 was available with um, a transverse straight six engine. But generally, they don't happen very often because they're very long. Um, I note rather beautifully, we've got the signature of Harris Mann, the designer. Uh, this car appeared at the NEC a few years ago and um, I think Harris Mann did come along to um, look at the cars and um, yeah I hope he's proud of what he achieved because I think this is a fantastic looking car. I mean concealed wipers pretty remarkable for that age. You can see them hiding um, underneath the bonnet edge there and uh, dropped on the ambassador as we'll see but um, yeah there we go Tw twin carburetor 110 horsepower, free speed automatic gearbox is beneath. Uh, I think it shares the sun coil. It certainly looks like it probably does. Um, so um, I think it was AP developed that transmission. They also did an automatic in the Mini. But uh, I should probably stop prattling. We should look elsewhere. We'll Taking the interior, we've got these gorgeous plush velour seats with their own little armrests. Uh, that's lovely to see. Oh, look at the action on those babies. That's um, beautiful. And uh, if I jump aboard, we can take in some of the wood of the dashboard. You know, a Philips a cassette player with quartz tuning. Little Wolseley logo on the um, cigarette lighter. Fresh air vents to the face. We've got an aftermarket um, tachometer down here because um, they didn't fit a rev counter. And um, there's the gear selector for the free speed automatic transmission. We have got an aftermarket steering wheel, which you may think looks a little ridiculous, but the, it's the owner's preference. It's a thicker rim, more comfortable to hold. And um, this isn't a museum piece. He does drive this car. He does drive it to events. So um, yeah, that, that's a slight compromise there is that he's fitted his own steering wheel, sporty little motor liter with Wolseley badge. I love the period collect correct torch and um, here you can see some of Lucas's finest wiring and um, that looks remarkably like the indicator plug on my Invercar. Um, so maybe I should pinch the indicator stalk because mine's broken. Um, we've got the um, optional switch gear over here and uh, not many blanking plugs. This has been a top spec model. Uh, I'll just take you through some of them. Um, so we've got this one. Oh, maybe we haven't got, oh no, we have got the ignition on. Why is that not working? Maybe we won't do that at all then. Uh, so we've got hazard lights. Interesting. M M Morse code on the um, flusher relay there. It's a very quiet indicator, which I think is why he's fitted a warning beeper. Uh, we've got front fog lights. We've got rear fog lights. We've got, what on earth is that? Um, is that cruise control? Surely not. Um, might have to have a play with that later on. Um, three binnacles ahead of us, but one big clock. And uh, the indicator stalks are to the continental style indicators on the left. Naturally, we will come to a wiper test soon enough, don't you worry. But very comfortable seats. And um, yeah, you could definitely sit here for a while. Look at the thickness of the seats. They're immense. And uh, a little parcel shelf down there, a little glove box here. Perfect to store your cassettes. Shall we check out his, his um, taste? My fair lady, Kirita Kanawa, blimey. Um, yeah, she, she can sing. But um, yeah, all, all very period correct, I love it. There's even some old tax discs in there. Wow, that's lovely to see. Lovely details. Here in the rear, lots of space. Um, I'm just about okay for headroom. Lots of legroom because um, a very long car. It follows on from the Land Crab. But um, I think what Harris Mann has managed to do very well is disguise the width much better than was ever done on the Land Crab. Uh, we've got a lovely chunky armrest here, again with a lovely action upon it. Oh, that's nice. Um, so, yeah, very comfortable spot. I like the period correct books on the parcel shelf as well. All very good. And um, yeah. It's definitely a comfortable place to sit. Check out the boot. Note it says automatic. It's quite a capacious boot. I've got the spare wheel mounted at the side. But the problem is, yeah, it, it's a bit of a restricted opening. Uh, the rear seats don't fold down. So what you see is what you get.
You're sitting comfortably. I will begin. Yeah, not not the most um, quality sound when you close the door. It's a bit of a bang. But uh, if we fire up the E6 engine. Just let it settle down to an idle. That's nice noise. And um, let's remember the Citroen CX may have been available with more power, but the CX never had the six cylinder engine it really, really needed. Um, and of course, um, some of its other rivals very much did. So not the smoothest transmission ever. Uh, it has to be said, but um, already the ride is floating along. Oh, there's the indicator noise. Slightly, yeah, slightly necessary, but a little unfortunate. So yeah, not quite the float of a Citroen, but the hydrogas suspension does work pretty well at ironing out the bumps. This may have been luxury for 1975, but still the windows are keep fit. So the um, Princess range, uh, such as it is, even though this isn't a Princess, uh, was uh, launched in 1975, and unfortunately they were built in Cowley. And uh, oh, that really is a horrible noise. And Cowley at the time was a place of great industrial unrest. So many strikes going on. Not that it was just strikes at British Leyland, but were causing problems. SU Carburettors had a strike which held up production for uh, some weeks. So, um, yeah, this car always had that problem, that stigma to try and um, cope with. Try and open up the vents, get some fresh air in here. Oh yeah, that's good. Good, fresh air to the face. Nice, powerful disc drum brakes. Help us bring down the speed quite easily. We're going to drive into Winchester. That is a lovely noise, I have to say. It's the first time I've driven a six cylinder um, of EVA type Land Crab Audis. They were the only cars to use the E6 engine in the UK. The E6 engine was used in the Austin Kimberley in Australia and also fitted to the Morris Marina in Australia and I think South Africa as well. And I think they might even have been built in New Zealand actually. So I hope to find one of those when I go down under later this year. Um, 2.6 litres they managed to get them up to down there. I wonder how they managed that. Did it make the stroke even longer? Like I say, with Siamese bores, there really wasn't any expansion room. Uh, always a bit of a compromised engine. Because originally the E series was meant to replace the A series en engine, which was 1 litre and 1.3. Um, you have to wonder just how they managed to get things so spectacularly wrong. Um, in the British motor industry. Uh, always end up with these engines that aren't quite right and in cars that aren't quite right. And certainly quality problems were a big issue for the uh, Princess back in the day. Uh, they managed to sort out a lot of issues by the time the Princess 2 came along and, uh, in um, 1978. But by then the damage had been done. Buyers were wary and stayed away and went and bought Ford Granadas instead, or the new wave of Japanese cars that were coming in, which would be a lot smoother than this in terms of um, transmission, even if ultimately the Japanese cars couldn't quite compete for ride quality. They could get the, hand, the, the ride quality fairly good, what they couldn't do is get the handling good, whereas this feels nice and sharp. Uh, the power steering helps because obviously the gearing is that much more direct. 
but um, I know what you're after and uh, we've got to go there. There we go. The wipers come out to play from their secret hiding place. I can report a very slight triangle of doom. Disappointing. We'll do a bit of driving around town and then we'll get her out on the open road. But it's a very easy car to place, despite the fact the bonnet goes spearing off in front of me and I can't really see where it's gone. And of course I can't see where the tail of the car is either. It extends some way beyond the rear window, but I have no idea how much from here. But we've got twin door mirrors so um, and good visibility, nice large side windows. Uh, and this lovely piece of wood in front of me as well. They did develop a Van den Pla version of the Wedge Princess, but it never saw light of day. The one remaining um, prototype uh, is part of the British Motor Museum at Gaydon in Warwickshire. Uh, that place well worth a visit. And we'll discuss that place more in the Ambassador video for very obvious reasons. But it seems remarkable, looking back, that this car, this development car, could be bought privately back in the day, but things were very different in the 1970s. And, um, like I say, Martin, the owner, was just looking for a cheap car at the time. Had no idea um, he would end up with a car of such historic importance. And it is a bit nerve-wracking, to be honest. I'm driving round in the earliest survivor of this shape. Uh, there are no others. Actually, no, that's not true. I think there are some pre-production cars, but this is still the earliest, and certainly the earliest one on the road. But I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how the Ambassador compares. I've um, not driven an Ambassador before, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that one goes, how it feels. Uh, the Ambassador did not use the six-cylinder engine. They dropped it by then because it's a thirsty old Hector. I think 20 MPG was considered pretty much the norm. But you can hear the bumps, I'm not being jostled by the bumps. It's fairly peaceful, there's just a bit of a squeak going on from somewhere. And sadly, that's the sort of thing that was a bit too common with these cars. But the fit and finish was just not quite where it needed to be. Same also true of the SD1, to be fair. Certainly in um, Series 1 form. But it's, it's certainly a characterful car and it gets massive attention. I've uh, been driving it around, um, or even when I was doing the recording earlier of it parked up, um, people were stopping to take an interest. So um, I certainly like it for that. And it is such a dramatic shape, that wedge profile that Harris Mann was so keen on, employed to good effect on the Princess and the uh, TR7. See if the back will drop. Oh yeah, there it goes. And back up again as I put it in neutral. Bouncy, bouncy. Ooh, funk. Yeah, that's not a smooth transition into drive, which is why I often leave automatics in drive. Because, uh, yeah, not all of them are particularly smooth. But here we are driving around the streets of Winchester, which I'm not sure I've ever really done before. No idea where I'm going at all. Yeah, the steering is geared really nicely. And uh, I think, though you may dislike it, this um, four-spoke motor litre steering wheel um, is, um, yeah, good. Because you've got power steering, you don't need the leverage of a larger wheel. The other thing you're not getting is the smell. When I arrived at Martin's house this morning, uh, his driveway smelt like the British Motor Museum. Um, something very BL, maybe it's that, um, you know, Lucas Loom smoke escaping, I don't know. But, um, yeah, interesting aromas. Uh, I think we shall go left, because no one else is. Which is surely reason enough. Right, go and find some more interesting roads. Don't get run over by my wedge. I like that, the lane split, but there's no sign to tell me which lane I need to be in. Uh, it's going to be the one on the right, isn't it? 
Oh, well, we'll go this way instead then. But yes, I, I guess overall it feels quite normal, which uh, a land crab does not. Uh, a land crab is a very strange thing. The driving position is distinctly odd. You've got that bus-like steering wheel in a land crab and the fact the dashboard is so far away because um, Alec Izagonis didn't give two hoots about ergonomics. Eventually the third gear did come. I was just starting to wonder if I'd left it in second. Yeah, that's a lovely noise. It isn't a powerful car by any stretch of the imagination, but um, it makes pleasing noises. Oh yeah, now we're moving along. I can feel it really starting to float a bit. It isn't as loose in terms of float as a CX, uh, but it's still got a pretty good magic carpet ride. So when, with the arrival of the Princess 2 in 1978, uh, the um, B series engine was finally replaced by the overhead camshaft O series engine. Uh, another 1.7 litre engine with an overhead cam that kind of took over from the E series in some ways, though not in others. Just typical product overlap really. Kick down. I mean, I know, I know that was uphill, but that was not fierce acceleration. But yeah, all the right noises. And I guess the good thing about an engine that's less powerful is you can extend it more readily uh, on the public road. Oh yeah, it feels very much built with roads like this in mind. I can't say there's an awful lot of feel in that steering. Oh, that way looks fun. Let's go that way. But, um, yeah, it, um, it rolls a bit, but it handles well. I think these were available with um, Dunlop De Novo run flat tyres back in the day as well. There's a reasonable amount of torque there. So that was the Wolseley 2200, a particularly interesting example. Uh, it's nice to finally spend some time with one. I've not done very many miles in these Wedge Princesses at all. So um, yeah, an eye-opening experience for sure. But what's the Ambassador going to be like by way of comparison? Well, you'll have to stay tuned and we shall find out in the next video. So thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell and then you'll be told when the next video goes live or just keep an eye on the channel. And remember, Hubnut goodies can be purchased at hubnut.org. Uh, I will say particular thanks to the Leyland Princess Owners Club, uh, leylandprincess.co.uk. They do sterling work to preserve these cars. And yeah, I shall see you in a future video. Farewell. Oh, that was the right turn I wanted, okay. I'm doing very badly at this. <laughs>